I think we should make a start. Welcome everyone. Um, we are on a tight schedule, so I'd like us to uh, use this time wisely. Welcome, welcome to the launch of this really important report caught in the Carcero web, um, of anti-trafficking laws and policies and their impact on migrant sex workers. It's, um, I would like to um, invite everyone who's joining us today to you are busy introducing yourselves on the chat, but if you have questions to please put them in the Q&A and we'll have some time at the end of the presentations to uh, address those hopefully, all of them. Um, before I introduce the speakers today, our panelists, I would like to um, read the land acknowledgement. McMaster University recognizes and acknowledges that it's located on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. The Dish with One Spoon Agreement represents a covenant with nature. Take what you need, leave something in the dish for others and keep the dish clean. Our speakers, presenters today, are um, in the order that they'll be speaking also. Professor Judy Judge, who is Leona, the Leona Enrico Henry Mancinelli Professor of Global Labor Issues, the School of Labor Studies, McMaster University. Sandra Kahon Chu, co-executive director, of the HIV Legal Network. Vincent Wong, lawyer and PhD candidate of Oscar Hall Law School. And Elaine Lam, executive director of Butterfly and PhD candidate in the School of Social Work, McMaster University. I am Kamala Kempadu and I'll be moderating. I am professor of the, in the Department of Social Science at York University. I should also um, mention that this research project that we will be discussing today is funded by the Leona Enrico Henry Mancinelli Professor of Global Labor Issues in McMaster University. And this event today is organized by the School of Labor Studies and co-sponsored by the School of Social Work at McMaster University. So this report is a really important report for us here. Um, we've been talking for many years, many of us have been talking for many years about the harms and, uh, of anti-trafficking laws and policies. And we, can't, we have not enough data and empirical research um, to make this argument always, but from around the world, we've been seeing similar kinds of trends. People have been speaking about this. And this report is really an important intervention um, for the Canadian context. Um, and it's something that is much needed. And I hope we can um, pay close attention to what is being said. The report itself is just was made available today and it is up on various websites. And I think it will also be, at, um, the link will be sent here in the chat. Um, but also available through Butterfly as well as through Professor Judge's um, website link. Um, I'm not going to say anything really on this, although this is my area of research and I've been well, I'm well informed about the international debates that take place around anti-trafficking and, and, the, and the real harms that it inflicts on um, migrant sex workers um, globally. This is so important for us to recognize this, to speak about it, to push back against it, and to demand change of the policies and laws. Um, so um, I look forward to our discussion. I'm going to hand it over first to Professor Judge, who will um, begin by talking a little bit about the context of the report. Hi, Kamala. Thanks very much. My name is Judy Fudge. It's the candy rather than the legal position. And 
Thank you for elevating me. I really appreciate that. It's less funny than fudge. So my task- My apologies, my apologies. No, no problems. Everyone does it. My task is to provide a very brief overview of the findings of our report, Caught in the Carceral Web anti-trafficking laws and policies and their impact on migrant sex workers. But before doing so, I just want to explain how the report came about. I was working on a book on laws and policies to combat traffic, labor trafficking and modern slavery in the UK. And I was having a really hard time making progress with it. The problem was that I wanted to avoid talking about sex trafficking because it is such a polarized topic. I did not want to get sidetracked down the rabbit hole of arguing about whether the sale and purchase of sexual services should be banned. Although sex and labor trafficking are treated as different forms of exploitation, the literature I was reading suggested that this distinction reflects sexist assumptions and moralism rather than being based upon evidence. While I was at a migration conference in Europe in 2019, I explained to a group of researchers studying the impact of anti-trafficking laws on migrant sex workers, why I could no longer write about labor trafficking without discussing sex work. One of them told me I should contact Elaine Lamb, who was doing a PhD at the university I was teaching at because she had a great deal of knowledge about migrant sex workers. I contacted Elaine and asked her if there was any research, or research I could assist her with. I already knew that the bulk of the evidence-based research in Canada demonstrates that criminalizing sex work is harmful to sex workers. I was also aware that the original anti-trafficking laws a series of international treaties beginning in 1904 equated prostitution with human trafficking, referring to it as white slavery. The concern was that European women were being transported across borders, especially to the colonies for the purpose of prostitution. Anyone who knows the history of anti-trafficking knows that these laws which were purportedly designed to protect women were based on harmful racist and sexist stereotypes. But what I did not know and what Elaine told me about was the 2012 regulation issued under Canada's Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, prohibiting all foreign nationals without permanent resident status from working in any capacity in strip clubs, massage parlors, or escort services. The prohibition is printed on visitor, student, and temporary visas, and it's justified as protecting foreign nationals, especially young women, from exploitation. These regulations authorize immigration officials to prevent the admittance of foreign nationals suspected to be traveling to Canada to work in the commercial sex sector and to deport foreign nationals found working in industries that are deemed to be sex related. These regulations are very troubling. Not only is it permissible for permanent residents and Canadian citizens to work in these sex related industries, on its face, deportation seems like a strange way to protect people who officials perceive to be vulnerable to exploitation. What I learned from talking with Elaine and doing more research is that in Canada, there is a vast multi-scalar web of laws, immigration, criminal, provincial, and municipal bylaws that are justified on the ground that they protect migrant women from human trafficking. However, as I discovered and Elaine confirmed, there is very little research that specifically focuses on the impact of these carceral laws on the well being of migrant workers in the sex industry in Canada. So Elaine and I decided to join forces and to conduct a study to discover the impact of these laws and policies on migrant sex workers. 
Our goal was to center the voices and perspectives of migrant sex workers to illuminate their experiences rather than simply to rely on the narratives of anti-trafficking advocates who want to rescue them. To do this, we decided to do first, interview migrant sex workers and their advocates on their experience of these laws. Second, to review the literature providing evidence on the impact of these laws on the well-being of sex workers in general and migrant sex workers in particular. Third, to provide a historical context for these laws and policies. And fourth, to present a detailed mapping of the complex interaction of these four areas of law, criminal, immigration, provincial, and municipal bylaws in Ontario and Toronto. We asked Sandra and Vince to co-author the report since they are experts in these areas of law and they know how they're applied to migrant sex workers. Our report and recommendations are based on this research. Sandra and Vince will discuss the legal strands that create this endless web of criminality. And Elaine will discuss the study she and I conducted of the impact of these laws on the well being of migrant sex workers. I did the comprehensive literature review of the evidence based research in Canada, which is published in public health, medical, sociological, social work, legal, and criminology journals as well as that produced by civil society organizations working with sex workers. To be included in this review, the researcher had to be based on evidence. This search uncovered no evidence that this carceral web of anti-trafficking laws and policies protects migrant, migrant women from trafficking. Instead, it revealed that migrant sex workers are targeted by law enforcement through surveillance, racial profiling, arrest, detention, and deportation in the name of protecting them from human trafficking. Our study supports the findings of this research. These laws and policies make migrant sex workers more susceptible to poor working conditions, exploitation, predation, racism, and ill health. Sex work, like all forms of feminized work, such as domestic work, childcare, and serving, is riddled with sexist assumptions. And it is tied up with intersecting social relations that make some groups, racialized or trans people, more vulnerable to exploitation. Moreover, some forms of feminized work, such as domestic work performed by migrant workers, are associated with coercion and exploitation and reflect and reinforce sexist assumptions about appropriate gender roles. However, in Canada, we do not ban these forms of work or migrants from performing this work in order either to protect women or to disrupt prevailing sexist gender norms. Moreover, with other activities that either offend some people's moral beliefs or cause harm to the persons engaging in them, such as the use of restricted drugs, for example, we have, based on evidence and research, changed our policies from criminalizing and punishing people who inject restricted drugs to adopting harm reduction policies such as safe injection sites. Our report demonstrates the need to pay attention to the evidence of the harm Canada's current carceral approach to human trafficking causes to the migrant sex workers that it is supposed to protect. Repealing these laws and policies is not a silver bullet for ending human trafficking, but doing so would reduce the harmful impact they have on migrant sex workers and would also allow us to focus on developing laws and policies that address coercion and exploitation. Thank you. I'm going to pass it on to Sandra. <laughs> Thank you, Judy. Sandra. 
Thank you, Judy. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen. I have some slides to share with you today. So I'm going to focus on some of the criminal laws that um, Judy mentioned uh, that are the two of the major strands of the carceral web that migrant sex workers find themselves in. First, um, the human trafficking laws. If I can just uh, advance my slide. Um, there you go. So the human tra trafficking laws were actually um, relatively new. They were introduced in 2005, and they're a response to a report from the US, uh, the American government's trafficking in persons report that lowered Canada's rank ranking in human trafficking, the, the scale of human trafficking where they used to assess how countries are doing in this on human trafficking. And so the Canadian government introduced these three major pro prohibitions on human trafficking. I'm not going to read them out to you. You can see them on the screen, but they're mainly the definition of human trafficking, materially benefiting from human trafficking, withholding or destroying travel or, or ID documents related to human trafficking. So these are the three major prohibitions. Um, they've been bolstered by consecutive national strategies, and it's not um, specific to a uh, federal government. Uh, the Conservative government introduced $25 million over four, four years to introduce aggressive new initiatives to prevent human trafficking. Um, following that, the Liberal government, and here's the then Public Safety Minister uh, Ralph Goodale at the time, allocated $75 million over six years to support the coordination of Canadian law enforcement outreach operations to proactively identify potential victims of human trafficking. And that included major infusions of money for law enforcement initiatives. And we've seen the impact of that, and I'm sure Elaine will describe some of that on migrant sex workers in particular. I'm not going to spend some too much time talking about provincial strategies, but I just wanted to add that the Ontario government also has invested, it, most recently, more than $300 million in a provincial human trafficking strategy at a time, this was in 2020, at a time when we also saw some of the deepest cuts to legal aid and social services in this province. So just consider all these infusions of resources into human trafficking strategies at the same time we're cutting social service to people who probably need them the most. So what has been the outcome of this? What we've seen is the majority of human trafficking uh, reported by the police involve women and girls as, as alleged victims. So this comes directly from Statistic Canada, Statistics Canada. Um, they say human traffic for the pur purpose of domestic sexual exploitation is the most prevalent. And this comes um, from police accounts specifically. Um, and most of the charges are originate from criminal code offenses. So the first three human trafficking offenses I just had in my first slide, not the Immigration Refugee Act, uh, human trafficking offenses, which Vince will talk about in the next section. So what we've seen is very few cases of non-sexual labor trafficking have been uh, pursued, and there's a very narrow framing of human traffic trafficking as almost exclusively sex trafficking. I'm having some problems with my slide. Okay, well, maybe I'll just, um, I'll just go on to talk about the, um, the sex work offenses um, without moving the slides. So at this, in 2014, the co um, Conservative government in response to Supreme Court of Canada ruling in a case called Bedford, which many of you probably know about, introduced a number of offenses criminalizing sex work. Um, there's five main offenses that I'll talk about today. There's a one that criminalizes uh, public communication for the purpose of prostitution, impeding traffic, um, and, um, purchasing sexual services, materially benefiting from sexual services, procuring sexual services, and advertising sexual services. At the time this legislation was introduced, the preamble of the legislation said that prostitution is inherently exploitative and the government is concerned about the risk of violence posed to those who engage in it. Then Justice Minister McKay said that decriminalization and legalization of sex would work would actually lead to increased human trafficking for the purpose of sexual exploitation. And so PSEPA, the Protection of Communities and Exploited Persons Act, was meant to ensure consistency between sex work and human trafficking offenses. And it was also characterized as meaning to intended to clamp down on sex work and uh, as a way to protect vulnerable women, such as migrant women, from exploitation. So what have we seen as a result of these, um, uh, this human trafficking and sex work conflation? Since 2009, 63% of all human trafficking police reports have a secondary violation that has also involved a sex work offense. That means when somebody is charged with human trafficking, 
in almost two thirds of the cases, somebody is also charged with a sex work offense, mostly what we call the third party offenses, which is the material benefiting, procuring and advertising offenses. When the charges are actually laid, about a third of them are laid in conjunction with sex work offenses. This conflation has uh, resulted in what um, academics Miller and O'Doherty have said, uh, suggest a conflation of trafficking and sex work that is tied to a deeply entrenched narrative of a parasitic and exploitative nature of the relationship between what they call, quote, pimp and prostitute. As a result of uh, these laws, uh, sex workers and migrant sex workers in particular have experienced great deals of harm. Um, and especially migrant sex workers who, who uh, might benefit from the social networks that are often the target of these third-party offenses, the material benefiting, procuring sexual services and advertising offenses. And in 2021, the Canadian Alliance for Sex Work Law Reform in, in, with six individual applicants challenged these sex work laws on the basis that they violate sex workers' char charter rights, their rights to liberty, security of the person, autonomy, um, right to equality, freedom of association, and the freedom of expression. And this was launched in March 2021, um, and an extensive evidence record was filed along with the notice of application in Ontario Superior Court. And the re record also includes um, quite extensive evidence of the harms that these laws inflict on migrant sex workers. I will um, hand it over to Vince now, who will talk about the immigration and municipal bylaw offenses that also are part of this tangled web. Thank you so much, Sandra. Um, so I'll start off by, so I'll be talking about immigration and, and municipal bylaws. And it's important to note that human trafficking and sex work related criminal offenses can, for migrant workers, directly result in additional immigration sanctions and penalties as a result of this increasing integration of criminal and immigration law, law enforcement and sanctions. This history of targeting this group goes back to the very first immigration ban of any racialized group in Canada, the 1885 Chinese Immigration Law, Section 9, which bans any Chinese woman deemed to be a prostitute. And if you take a look at the debates at that time, that was justified on the grounds of immorality and its corrupting influence on white Canada and particularly white boys. The Royal Commission that undergirded these reforms also stated that Chinese women, particularly from the Guangdong province in southern China, were as a rule prostitutes. Now this connection between criminal and immigration law operates primarily through section 36 of the ARPA, the Immigration Refugee uh, Protection Act, a node by which criminal charges and convictions can be converted into removal of status, detention, and deportation. Even Canadian permanent residents could lose their status if they are convicted or plead guilty and receive a sentence of more than six months for a given offense, which if you go back to Sandra's presentation is possible if convicted of purchasing, material benefit, procurement, or advertising offenses, or any of the human trafficking criminal offenses. Uh, or if the offense they are convicted of and plead guilty to carry a maximum prison sentence of 10 years or more. So anything that is uh, either hybrid or indictable, regardless of the actual sentence, which includes, again, the majority of the criminal offenses that Sandra was talking about. A number of human trafficking specific offenses are also written directly into the ARPA. So now we're not talking about the criminal code. Uh, in ARPA, uh, for example, through sections uh, 117 and 118. Yet for all of the attention and resources that are devoted to combating cross-border human trafficking, uh, between January 1st, 2006 and July 13th, 2020, so a period of essentially 14 and a half years where we've had this regime, freedom of information requests indicate that CBSA recorded a total of eight charges laid under these provisions with zero convictions. This data suggests that anti-trafficking investigations and raids from an immigration perspective rarely, if ever, uncover traffickers in the context of cross-border migration. And yet, the specter and panic of cross-border human trafficking discourse is deployed significantly to curtail the ability of those who work in the sex industry 
to make a livelihood through legal means. As Judy was mentioning earlier, a two-tiered scheme has emerged through immigration regulations and work permit conditions in which workers who do not have permanent resident status, even if they otherwise have immigration work authorization, are banned uh, from sex work employment and are targeted by immigration enforcement if they work in any sort of sex work related industries, while Canadian permanent residents and citizens are not affected by this direct immigration prohibition. But as a result of this immigration ban, during police raids and other law enforcement encounters, such as through a uh, municipal bylaw and joint law enforcement raids, those with precarious immigration status risk being identified by and having information shared by police with CBSA, which may trigger a whole host of violations resulting in immigration detention and eventual deportation. This leads us to the final piece of the puzzle, which is municipal bylaws, the fourth uh, node in the carceral web that has uh, entrapped so many migrant sex workers. Now, as authorized by the Ontario Municipal Act, municipal bylaw officers actually have significant powers of entry, search, and seizure into workplaces and non-dwellings without a warrant for the purposes of inspection to determine uh, bylaw in compliance and to set substantial fines for non-compliance. In one of the cases that we really focus in on in the city of Toronto, in 2012, the city explicitly pivoted its municipal licensing and bylaw enforcement towards human trafficking, nuisance, health and safety, and so-called crime prevention. And as a result of this 2012 pivot, municipal bylaw enforcement practices skyrocketed. Under this pivot, municipal charges, ticketing, and licensing exclusions are seen as a key tool in making it unfeasible for body rub centers and massage parlors to e operate economically or to remove their licenses due to too many infractions. This helps us understand the data of why so many tickets uh, starting in 2012 and 2013 are for banal and immaterial infractions that really have no rational connection to combating the labor exploitation that undergirds trafficking. For example, tickets for uh, table mats in poor repair. From 2013 to 2016, the number of Toronto MLS inspections at holistic centers increased by 212%. The number of individual practitioners who were inspected increased by 323%. And the number of bylaw charges spiked by 2015%. Given that the individuals ticketed for infractions are predominantly migrant Asian women working in small parlor settings, a massive increase in charges can and has led to severe impacts on survival and livelihood. And because most of these uh, people, most of these women cannot afford legal representation, they thus have to plead guilty or are thought to that that is the only way to, to uh, deal with their legal matter. And so despite the massive spike of increases in inspection and charges towards these businesses, the city of Toronto decided again to double down in 2018 by budgeting to hire five new bylaw enforcement officers solely dedicated to monitoring and inspecting holistic centers and body rub parlors. To, fi to finalize this kind of a, a survey of municipal bylaw enforcement, there is also an increasing use of exclusionary licensing and zoning requirements for industries that are perceived as sex work related. Exclusionary zoning restrictions present significant safety and accessibility concerns for workers that increase their vulnerability. So for instance, 2013 zoning bylaws in Toronto resulted in body rub parlors being subject to the city's strictest zoning requirements, allowing them only in what is called employment industrial zones. So this is similar to uh, industries that spew uh, toxins and environmental pollutions. And by 
subjecting this to this zoning geographical exclusion without the benefit of proper outdoor lighting, adequate and frequent transit, or public and community presence, body rub workers coming to and from work are especially vulnerable to theft and violence. So to wrap up this part, what we see is, like in other areas, human trafficking discourse in municipal bylaw licensing and enforcement has a tremendously negative effect on migrant sex workers by increasing economic hardship and surveillance for those working in massage parlors or body rub settings. These four elements of punitive policy and law enforcement, that is criminal, immigration, provincial human trafficking, and municipal bylaws are motivated in large part by their claims to protect marginalized women, are experienced this is actually experienced holistically as part of an interlocking carceral web that traps migrant sex workers, exposes them to greater state violence and prosecution, and increases their exposure to non-state violence and exploitation, limiting their opportunities for safety and economic livelihood. So now I'll turn it to Eileen Lam on how these workers experience this carceral web from a firsthand perspective. Ali. Thank you, Vincent. And before we hand over to Elaine, I'd just like to remind everyone who's, who's attending today that if you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A box rather than the chat box so that we can have take those up um, as questions at the once Elaine has done given her talk. Elaine, over to you. Okay, thank you. So I think I start with the sharing for thank you for all the migrant sex worker like in Canada and all over the country, despite all the oppression, um, repressive policy and law they are facing, but they are still fighting and they are still trying different way to speak out. And I think um, we are so glad that some of the migrant sex worker have talked to us in this project. And I think this is so important. And the other thing I also want to thank you for all the steps Stakeholders, stakeholders share the knowledge and also um, that to, to tell us like what actually happened on the ground and also all the allies have been fighting with the um, um, migrant sex worker and I think this is so important. And yeah, so I would like to share like a PowerPoint. So, and I would talk about the findings, but I will not go to detail because I really want you to read the report because the, um, thank you for uh, Sandra and Vincent, like have laid out the like um, casual web, like how different law controlling um, sex worker actually make migrant sex worker have struggle instead of protection as being harmed every day. So, and I would like to um, share the, the, the image and PowerPoint that like, like um, you can see um, how the people actually is affect. So as I said, I would not um, go to detail, but I would like to highlight. So um, this research is really uh, talk to the worker directly. They talk about how they are being locked like hand harmed by different level of the law. So we have used the action research. So this is very important that um, the migrant sex worker also participating. And also we are really want to use this research to bring the change and stop this kind of harmful policy against them. And so for the participant, we have interviewed the trans sex worker, male sex worker, female sex worker, and in Mon Montreal, Vancouver, Toronto, and other York region and other city because migrant sex worker is mobile thing, like moving around so that like there is also different city they have been working and they have worked in different type of work including escort indoor massage and bdsm so and different type of work of course different type of work will affect their, their condition and and because of this race gender class is also affect uh, and also immigration status also affect the situation so and we talk to different stakeholders including sex worker rights activists um, service provider and also the legal professional they have knowledge and or they have been working with some client uh, facing this issue so and then I try to press next page. <laughs> okay, so this is the situation of the migrant sex worker. And why we want to talk about this because today, how many people joining 232 and we will make the video we want you to share with other people why it's so important we know today, we have policy maker we have law enforcement we have prosecutor, we have anti trafficking organization they have received tons of funding. And so some women organization they really believe that more law make people 
have better life. The law will make people safe. But what migrant sex worker telling you is no. So migrant sex worker themselves has been using different way. Migration itself for them is having better life. Some people may take uh, opportunity to see this seasonal um, migration because of their immigration status, the race, the gender, and that they are facing a lot of challenge, including like financial burden, like international student, they have high uh, school fee, low income racism, and particularly in job market, if you don't speak English, you are very difficult to find the like so-called decent, decent job, right? So, but sex work itself is very empowering for many um, participants they share, and also all the migrant sex workers share, like all the time, that actually doing sex work or massage work is give them better income, better working condition. And like this also can help them to overcome different language barrier. And some people also get different type of satisfaction in the job. But the assumption of their traffic victim, assumption they have, they, they don't have power, you know, to decide their life as actually is, 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 is take away the agency and deny the, 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 the right of the body. But all the law actually create the situation, make them be more precarious. So I do not read the code, I want you to read the report. So this is the, some of the code from, from the worker, like how it's work actually uh, give them income, they can support the children and some people, you know, that is like different interesting sexual adventure for them doing this job. So, and, but actually the law is not only take away the, the, the agency, the law is controlling the body, particularly there's a lot of sharing about trans women and also like sex worker talk about this. And actually, particularly the immigration policy and criminalization has increased the vulnerability and precarious. Like for example, Judy explained, people have work permits, suppose they can work, but because of immigration prohibition that even you have work permit, you cannot work in Canada, actually create the vulnerability that they need to force in working in very underground or difficult situation. And some worker also share like, in order to keep my immigration status, I will rather suffer all other like violence and, and different kind of experience like situation so that you can see actually is this law create a vulnerability just like um uh, Sandra and, and Vincent mentioned about and in the report that you you will hear the, the worker tell you directly about that like in the in and so the other big piece is like the impact of criminalization is not only arrest the put, people put in the jail the criminal record is make the people cannot get immigration status and also create a lot of barrier people to do different type of work. And also, as Vincent said, they can be kicked out from Canada. So this is all the fear is created by the law make them. Why the perpetrator target that? It's because they know they are precarious and who create this precarious? It's actually the law and who are advocate this law? Why we want to invite you to be here? You need to check your organization, whether you are advocate like more anti-trafficking policy, more immigration law, and people now saying, see, it's not a lot of traffic need being arrested. We need to have more harder, harsher law, but it's not make people safe. So that's why you really need to double check your carceral approach because why it's happened is not only this is a bad law enforcement, you are the prosecutor. You know that you are not only prosecute the people of trafficking. You know that the people just answering the phone of other people being prosecuted. So that's why we really hope you can listen. And if you are violence against women organization, anti-trafficking organization, when you do your advocacy, you need to know the harm you have caused. And I think this is very important. You may know about that. That's why we need to have this report to tell you that is the result of the advocacy work of many people. They claim they protect the people. They care about the people. People. So, and this is very important message, no matter when and how it's like many migrant sex worker, particular Asian women, they keep saying I'm not traffic victim, particularly people who are in such color. But this victim label to justify what Vincent just said, you know, that all this repressive by law policy, they claim to protect the people, but actually make people be more vulnerable. So, and for example, people is not allowed to lock the door. Right, that because they want to have more in power for inspection, but not allowed to, to lock the door actually make people have higher risk of violence. And 
and so that um, and also how how those racial profiling come in how racist assumption that like specific racialized people they don't have have ability to do, do do the decision and we often hear this from the deportation of anti-trafficking organization we were in Toronto we were in the new market that they say you see this Asian woman they can't speak English they have no ability to consent even I have beautiful accent doesn't mean I can't consent people speak Chinese loudly say I am a traffic victim we have interpreted but they are still not being listened so that's why we really want you to see and listen to the reality of the workers. Some people may in vulnerable situation, they be exploited, but it's same as restaurant. Restaurant have worker being exploited, but you do not say we criminalize restaurant. So many like people abused by their partner, marital relationship, we do not say we need to prosecute all the husband and arrest all the husband because some of the men is like abusing their wife, right? So that's, I think this is very important. You need to rethink your assumption of like who are the traffic victim and how this traffic victim assumption is being used to justify those repressive policy. So, and the other thing is many people really concerned about the violence. And so in, in the interview that is like different worker also talk about the violence experience and how they cannot go to the police. For us, police is only one of the solution. We don't think police is the best way, you know, to address the violence, but at least that in the legal system here, people should have rights. But you can see people when they really go to police, no matter voluntary, Almost none of the people we call police, but the neighbor may call police when people hear them screaming. But what the police has done when they arrive, they arrest them. So they carry out investigation. And so this thing is actually why people is being targeted because they know that the police is not going to protect this woman. And in butterfly event, the worker keeps saying, the police do not protect us. We need to protect ourselves. So I think this is also the time if you work in violence against women organization, how to explore the community intervention, transformative justice framework. And when you work with the people, racialized, migrant, you know that police, and legal system is not the way to help the people. You know it already, but why you use it for sex worker, right? So, and I think that's why we call for you to work together. Instead of putting the knife on the neck of the woman, instead of putting more power to the police, resources to the police, we should give the power on the woman hand. We should give the power and resources on the woman hand. And not only police and also not social worker right now is like how police justify their investigation by training trauma informed practice or go with the social worker doesn't mean that they do not cause the harm. If you really care about the violence of the sex worker and, and HIV AIDS and legal network have done a beautiful reports document the people in Ontario how they experience all kinds of violence from law enforcement. Same as here, who are the major perpetrator? How trans people being discriminated, racial profile, and abused by the law enforcement. And law enforcement are the major source of violence. When you say, I really want to end the violence, when you talk to the migrant sex worker, only few people say they really concerned about trafficking. What they concern is the police come to give me a ticket every day. The police ask me to do sex through free sexual service. And they ask me, they come to my place to harass me. So, and I think this is also important that we need to know how the power give the law enforcement actually is the tools they can do the undercover to arrest the people and they can do all this like discrimination uh, action and and harm to the to the worker and so and also something happening going on is like the shutdown of massage parlor so this is the recommendation so um it's more detailed in our report but asking for decriminalization of sex work repeal immigration prohibitation why is so important because the law do not make people safe is the law make people unsafe so what we need to do is build a um, uh, having the capacity building, the community can build the resistance and repeal the municipal bylaw which target the sex industry, stop this racial profiling and, and excessive law enforcement in different level and no CBSA involved in anti-trafficking rate. And so immediately stop any kind of 
discard law enforcement rate using the name of anti-trafficking, but actually is targeting sex worker in different places. And as Sandra said, it's a huge money go to anti-trafficking work. Instead of go to anti-trafficking work, the resources should be allocated to health, legal, and social service, and also the how to support the worker that can empower themselves. And very important, we hope and you can help us to spread this message. Sex work is not trafficking. Migrant sex worker is not trafficking. And status for all assessed with the fear policy. We have more detail in the report. And also many organizations keep advocating. I, I see Kamala face is like, this is the limitation of the report is because the report, we do not interfere with some ongoing case. So what happened is many cities now is shutting down the massage parlor, including your region. And Toronto is also, uh, under the threat that they may take away the holistic license, many people worry they will stop the work. And last year, even pandemic, so many workers in Ontario facing the racial profiling and also so many investigation carry out in, 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 in indoor sex worker that is claimed as again anti-trafficking, but like it's human right abuse. They lock people up and so and and so that's why we need your help to stop all this like a uh, thing and what you can do is like we will share the petition because we really want you to speak out so we why we, we invite you here because you know about it's important for the justice of migrant sex workers the more law do not make the worker more safe so this is a call for support for decriminalization of sex work and support sex worker rights so we will share in the chat box and help you individually and also organizationally we need more organization support to show the government criminal approach is not the solution of the safety of women. And thank you. This is so important. And I know Elaine has so much more to say to us uh, because of her work she's been doing for so many years, um, such important work in challenging anti-trafficking policies. And this report is giving us a wealth of information and evidence and Everyone here has contributed so much to this report. Um, we have only a few minutes really to, um, to take very much, uh, to take some discussion. And I'm seeing that there was a question um, about um, whether the report also addressed um, indigenous sex workers and what the conversations, what kind of conversations are going on there. The question seems to have disappeared somehow, but I saw that in the beginning. But that also ties in um, to um, a question about whether there are differences in how, in terms of how anti-trafficking laws have affected different subgroups of migrant sex workers, i.e. different nationalities, different ethnic groups. So perhaps we can take those, those two aspects together because I think they're also critical in thinking about the way in which racism also plays into, very directly into, um, through these anti-trafficking policies. So who, would somebody like to address that question? Yeah, I'll offer some thoughts initially yeah, uh -huh. on the uh, indigenous um, uh -huh. and trafficking, particularly of women and girls question. Uh, and of course, flagging this, contextualizing this with the respect for indigenous sovereignty and self-determination, right? Like none of this, uh, you know, I think indigenous communities are must be um, in charge of their own ways of governing and dealing with, with this uh, 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 issue. Um, but I, and, and I will say that uh, one of you know the common critiques of the human trafficking discourse is that it elides the way and in which the state and the legal framework that uh, is created by the state actually perpetuates and is one of the key drivers of traf the, the exploitation that leads to trafficking, right? And that is probably nowhere more obvious than with the colonial state's relationship with indigenous peoples. We know that it is actually the federal and provincial government policies like the Indian Act residential school systems, the 60s scoop, that results in, 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 in impoverishment, that results in the overrepresentation of indigenous children in, uh, in, in uh, state child protection, which results in over-incarceration massive over incarceration of indigenous communities and when we think about that then do we really think that relying on the same state apparatus of policing surveillance and prosecution by the colonial government is going to be the the way in which we remedy uh, this issue as opposed to 
the proper funding of indigenous social programs, healthcare, legal services, and, and infrastructure, right? Uh, and, and I go back to a um, uh, one thing an indigenous sex worker said in, in one of our community meetings with government um, stakeholders on the human trafficking uh, policy reform issues is that sex workers are anti-human trafficking, right? In the same way that in labor exploitation, your number one person that you fight with against these conditions are your fellow workers, not, not the government, not your employer, right? So uh, I think that provides us a way in which we can stop thinking about these uh, uh, issues of sex work and human trafficking as, um, as against each other and actually realize where uh, the oppression is coming from and how to organize against it. So oh. just some thoughts on, on that. That's really great. Does anybody want to add to that or do you want to address any of the other questions in the, um, in the Q&A box? Yeah, I see someone have put like sex work as an end of resistance. And I think that is like some common experience, what we hear from like different diverse like background sex worker, but they play out very differently. And the question is about us about different subgroup and how the racism play out is very interesting for what we hear from the worker and also the research show. For example, trans sex worker, they are racialized from South America. Mm -hmm. They allow them to put the assumption as the uh, like traffic women. And so because they are not being seen as like women in the way is like how transphobia is play out, but they are being seen as criminal. That is like how the law target them is see them as the criminal that like no matter they cross the road using traffic law, whatever way to policing racial profiling. That is very different with the Asian woman massage parlor, the assumption they are passive, that they can impose those traffic victim like label to then to have the anti-trafficking policy to shut down the workplace, right? And so for male sex worker, and that is like, because male sex worker often not being put the assumption of the traffic victim, we do not hear a lot of ray targeting like um, uh, gay community, but they are also play out very differently. So, and I think this is also sex worker, migrant sex worker, um, is showing the intersectionality of race, class, like immigration status. We really see that the people more privileged in the system, they may have very different with the intersect of all the oppression. So, and like, for example, if white sex worker, maybe from, from the uh, English speaking country, that their experience is very different with the people uh, come from like global South, like, yeah. yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Elaine. Um, Sandra. You want to intervene here, please. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on those two mm -hmm. points. Um, I think one of the worst things to address human trafficking is to criminalize sex work. And I think one of the um, piece, per, somebody spoke to that in the chat box. When you mm -hmm. conflate everything as exploitation, which our federal government has done with sex work, it makes it incredibly difficult to actually define what exploitation means, what it looks like, and to actually identify cases of human trafficking when those actually exist or situations of labor abuse, et cetera. Um, so that is one of the strongest messages that sex workers have shared with governments a time and time again, and that unfortunately never gets heard. And we're, we're hoping this is this report is one way to sort of illuminate that. Um, there was another question that in the Q and A that I wanted to address, which is the intersections between sex work prohibition and criminal drug laws. And in my work, I see I do a, a lot of work around drug policy. There are huge intersections. Um, we see cases, for instance, of sex workers being purportedly rescued um, by law enforcement and then getting charged with drug work offenses or drug prohibition offenses. If they have found drugs in the hotel room, um, they, they get charged it, under the guise of rescue. So, th so these um, prohibitions are all targeted towards a certain very marginalized people. Um, many people who are racialized, who are, are, are living in poverty, people who are working on the street, those are the uh, people who tend to get targeted. And I think there, it, it's just an awful, um, this carcel web is not just about sex workers, it's about many people who use drugs, et cetera. And it's, it's unfortunately um, many racialized and migrant people who get targeted. So I think we need to repeal a lot of these laws and not only the sex work laws, but the drug work, uh, drug prohibitions as well. Fantastic, yes, yes. It all needs to be turned back. All these, these very, very harmful laws. Um, just looking, like, this, is, yeah. this is the book is like um, 
uh, Julie, can you talk about like indigenous and sex worker if someone more interested maybe uh, can like get That's more fantastic. There are a few, a few more questions that were sort of be, people have been chatting about in the question and answer, but since we are almost at the end of our time, I'm going to hand it over to Judy and Elaine to actually talk a little bit about what they would like to see as the, the, the future events coming up. Um, but Judy, you might have a few more comments before that, um, just generally to help us wrap up this session. Thank you very much, Kamala. I'd also like to thank Keisha for organizing it and Yelena for also helping to organize it. And of course, mostly the migrant sex workers and their advocates who shared their experiences with us. I am optimistic that things can change. Whoever thought in Canada, we would see safe injection sites. At one point in time, that was considered an anathema. And now even people who thought we should prosecute them have changed their mind, hallelujah. So this can happen, but it means that people have to rely on evidence and not on stereotypes. And they have to understand that making more criminal laws does not make our world better. I don't know if we haven't understood Black Lives Matter, and the incarceration of indigenous and racialized people, it does not work. It causes harm. We need different policies. So please join us on November 4th from 11 a.m. to noon for a webinar, which is publicized in the chat called Why Decriminalizing Sex Work Will Help to End Trafficking. Canada in a global context. There is a growing awareness amongst leading anti-trafficking organizations that criminalizing the sale and or purchase of sexual services is very harmful for sex workers and does not in fact protect them from human trafficking, which involves coercion and exploitation, but instead makes them more vulnerable to it. We should be following the line of these anti-trafficking organizations and saying, this does not work. We need new ways to deal with it. Provide people with labor rights, human rights, social rights, and immigrations. That is the way forward. And we are really lucky we're going to have major anti-trafficking organizations, the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women, Freedom United, Elaine to talk about Canada, and Elena Shi to talk about this. So I really, really hope you can join us on November 4th if you're interested, and I'll pass it for, to Elaine for the final word. Thank you, Judy. And Elaine does indeed have the final word. We have a couple of minutes, Elaine. Yeah, I think thank you for everyone all put the thing together and thank you for all the migrant sex worker and all the allies fighting for so many years. And I see in the Q&A, so is we are optimistic to see how the, whether our recommendation will come like accepted by the government. So it's not only relying on us, it's relying on all of you. That's why we kept emphasize the call, we need you to take action. And so that's why we have the call to ask you and your organization and all other people, you know that to sign this um, statement to show the support. And also we need more and more support from your fights and stop shutting down of massage parlor. But I think more important is you need us to push back those castle web. I think it's two things. One criminal law is not helpful to migrant sex worker and other community like mental health, like people use drugs, like many people experience violence. So that is important for you to push back and explore other kind of community initiative that we don't need to rely on the police and criminal system that is harming people that 
actually there is other way that we can adjust the ease of people's face. And the other important thing is we need your help to push back that like anti-trafficking bubble, you know, like moral panic because so many people benefit that how many organization law enforcement get so much funding power resources on that and now it's also the tech organization right so i see some people in q a how we can push back it's like how like the surveillance on internet and also how to encourage more industry they benefit from the vulnerability of the sex worker by creating more vulnerability they have like more funding and resources. And I think this is something we need you to push back and keep help us to spread the message. Sex worker is not trafficking. Sex work is the work that needs to be recognized. And, and, and Butterfly do not use the term like um, labor trafficking or sexual trafficking because we think if we just listen to the term human trafficking, we don't know what actually happened. So instead of being looped, they always say sex worker being looped in the sex industry. But we have so many people looped in this like household web and anti-trafficking bubble that you need to have your critical analysis and critical approach, how to do the thing differently and, and how to not reinforce like those uh, moral panic of like human trafficking that um, for butterfly we keep take away the language that we don't use the term human trafficking instead we look at what actually happened is it um, a spouse like um, a, a domestic abuse between the partner or is it the 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 the, the, the boss don't pay the salary so and and I think that if we can use like the labor framework if we use other framework we will have more way to find the solution and support the community and thank you thank you so much elaine we've run out of time but i urge everyone to read the report to attend the webinar on november 4th and to inform yourself there's so much information and so much advice being given here today about how to go forward to abandon this idea of anti anti-trafficking trafficking and anti-trafficking and to support migrant sex workers in their lives in the ways that they want to live and um, in, in helping them to have a future. I thank you all as panelists, um, Judy, Sandra, Vincent, and Elaine for this really important presentation. And we look forward to further discussion. Thank you all attendees. Thank you all for um, joining us today. And we hope that you can take this information further. Thank you. <laughs>